All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. First things first, 2022 Lexus GX 460. This one is a black line edition in black, and we are going to do our Dobinsons, and we are gonna do some BFGs, and we are gonna also do these, these right here, these Wedsport TC 105s. Those are Japanese, and they are forged. They're awesome. If you saw our video about our green one, it's the same thing. Same kit, Dobinson's IMS, Dobinson's upper control arms, wed sports, BFGs, 285s. You know what we gotta do? We gotta get her done. that like button and subscribe to the channel also if you would like more content follow social media at Cody crafted on Instagram all right so as you can tell we don't have any lifts in here yet but we do have our quick jacks we're set up we got to lift this rig let's get a measurement I do love the black chrome I'm a big fan big fan of the black chrome currently sitting 34 and a half to the fender in the rear 36 and an eighth so we got two inches of rake in it now watch because kdss it never fails it never sits level even though this thing's only got 2,000 miles on it well i say that <laughs> i say that yeah okay we're a little out we're three eighths out right here now that we've got our initial base measurements let's raise this puppy up definitely faster than jack stands. All right, let's get some wheels off. It's like Darth Vader's hovercraft. Prepare my ship. All right, this is a 2,000 mile car. So it has barely seen anything. So the good news is all the hardware is gonna be free and we won't have to fight with anything. So I'm gonna give you my play-by-play -play on how I do this start to finish. We've done a bunch of install videos of various ones, but let's give you the whole rundown on this one, I guess. Uh, first place I start, because we have a solid axle in the rear with springs, and I think I've touched on this before, uh, with coil springs in the back. First thing I do is the rear. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is this abs wire we don't want to overextend it so we're going to loosen its retaining bolt and i always put the hardware back where they go even if it's just a couple of threads all right there's one there and then there is another one on the other side for the rear brake lines same deal. Follow the rear brake lines up. You'll see the bracket that holds it to the chassis. Now that that's done, first thing you're gonna do is loosen the 19 millimeter for the track bar. Then I find it easiest to remove the sway bar with a 14. You wanna kinda of do this in stages so it doesn't just go flying. Alrighty, so what that's gonna do is allow the rear end to droop further away so that we can get the rear coils in and out that much easier. With that track bar tight and this sway bar hooked up, you really gotta fight them. If you just take a second, take these off, but be mindful when you put them back in, you wanna start them by hand, you don't wanna just zap them on with an impact. Okay, so next thing we're gonna do is loosen the control arms. We wanna make sure they're all loose and then we'll go back and retighten them once we're at right height after the fact. All right, as you can see, the bushings are in tension. This is also a 19. You don't have to take all these bolts out, but you do have to get them all loose because otherwise the bushings are in a bind and you heard it pop right there. And what happens is the rear end won't drop all the way out to where you can replace the coils. All right, this last one's kind of a bear. So we're going nutty. 
what happens is the bushing is bound up on this one above the fuel tank and you cannot use an impact on it because the bushing soaks up all the vibration. So what I use is the big nasty three quarter inch breaker bar. All right, now that we've got that dirty rat all taken care of, pull the lower bolt out of the shock and then up top. Okay, so this is where a set of ratcheting wrenches comes in real handy, except the shock wants to spin. Trick for that, big channel locks. You just hold the body of the shock. All right, once you get close to the top, that's the part where you want to put a jack under the rear end. All right, jack goes under the rear end. We're using the Badlands three-ton off-road jack right now. If you haven't seen our initial impressions video, be sure to check that out. So that holds that in place. And at this point, you can go ahead and remove the shock. Right here, it's pretty loose, so you can just hold it. So once you got your shock loose, you can slowly lower your jack and your rear end basically comes free. And bring the jack on down slowly. And that pivots that out. And now the trick is you have leverage here. The bushing in the bottom is really tight. So you just use the top to make the bottom slide off that much easier. At this juncture, on either side of the rear end, once again, double check your wiring and hoses. Make sure you're not putting any undue strain on anything. And your coil basically falls right out. All right, so here's our stock coil. Here's our new Dobinson's coil. These are uh, C59 599s, which is like a 1.5 lift in the rear. You can tell the wires you know, we got a full extra turn. The wire diameter is about the same, so they're just about as strong. Should ride real similar to stock. Yes, this coil was red. Uh, you really can't see them. Customer did approve me painting it black. He wanted black, but you really can't see them, and no problem. So, no big deal there. These are five, no, 325s, sorry, C59 325s. And as you can tell, those dudes way stiffer than stock the wire diameter is a lot thicker so what we're going to do is we're going to put this puppy in and uh we're going to carry on and get this rear reassembled the opposite side passenger side is the exact same so we're going to get our formerly red now black coil and uh put it inside so you take the stock bump stop and there's a wear mark where the pigtail end of the coil used to ride so we'll put that right on top where our other one was. And because we've loosened everything, this dude shouldn't fight us too much. So we'll lower the jack a little bit, push down on the diff a little, find the top pocket, and just kind of pop that dude right in. Raise our jack up, make sure that we're seated properly up above. Looking good. All right. So we'll put a little bit of pressure on it just to hold it in place and grab our rear shock. All right, let's open these dudes up. So what I do, turn them upside down, push down, and then flip it over and let it extend. Take the cover off. See, we have some actual rebound versus the stock one. Comes right up real fast. Yeah. See, our length is very similar. We're just a little bit longer. Okay, so just like when we took it off, we're gonna take the bottom, install it first. That way we don't have to fight the bushing in the lower. You go ahead and start the bolt. Make sure you leave it hanging out if you're not gonna go ahead and tighten it. All right. As you can see up here, this washer is gonna index in the hole in this vicinity. So we'll lower our jack slightly. Use the leverage of having the shock free at the top. And then work the jack up. 
so that the stud protrudes. Oh, oh God, stud, stud, hit the stud. Because otherwise you gotta fight it real bad. Once we get it most of the way through, put the bushing on. And the washer. And then start the provided nut, which is an 18 millimeter. The ones that came off were 17. Keep that in mind. I'm gonna start that. Make sure we're locked in. See how it wiggles? Put a little more pressure on it. There we go. Get the nut started. Since our other shock body has uh, just a shell on it, and these have the machined flats, we use a big crescent wrench to hold it in place so that the shock body doesn't spin while we try to tighten the top. So we'll start with an open end wrench. And on this one part, I like to start with a stubby one just for the speed. So we'll get this guy started. And once you get it down a little ways, you should be able to get your ratcheting end on there. If you've got a flex head, then that's even better. I've done it with both, it's not a problem. The flex heads are spendy, but they are handy. Now that we've got that going. Ludicrous speed, go! Now that we're sort of snug, we're going to a longer flex head ratcheting wrench. And that gives us a little more leverage. You wanna to try to hold the shock body relatively still. It's not perfect, but you just don't wanna beat it up. And run it down basically until the nut stops. You don't have to kill it, but you want it good and snug. Fish your wrench out. We'll then pull the shock boot up and install the provided zip tie. Being sure to cut that tail flush. Otherwise, you're fired. You're fired! Well the bottom one also gets a zip tie. All right, now that we got this side done, let's do the same thing on the other side. Lather, rinse, and repeat. All right, this side's done. And when I'm not having to talk about it, it literally took like seven minutes. Done. Yeehaw. And now we move to the front. It's a little later on because, you know, stuff happens. And uh, we got a front to do. Let's get this thing ripped apart. First thing we're gonna do, drop the skid plate. Drop it like it's hot. Drop it like it's hot. And loosen the control arms. First thing, skid plate. 12 millimeter. And just let her hang. If you want to, you can go ahead and pop this off. I may here in a second. There's one push pin and two 10 millimeter screws that hold it together. Um, but I think we'll be okay. Once we do that, 17 on the sway bar. Just like the rear, you want it to go kind of slow. And the KBSS cylinder is gonna push that down. Stick our bolts back in our caps so we don't lose them. All right, so on the lower control arm bolts, you want to loosen those so that the bushings aren't in a bind, just like we did on the rear. And these are a 22. They're pretty stout. The bolt gets loosened in the front, and on the back, it's the nut. Same thing, about a turn. And while you got that tool out, you might as well go ahead and do the other side. All right, so we're out of a bind there. Now, before you start loosening a bunch of other stuff up, we want the weight of the spring pushing down on the control arm because we have to separate this ball joint. So you just push in, pull that out a little bit, 
Get your pin out of the way. This is a 19. Crack that dude loose. Sometimes on these new cars, it'll pop right out, which this one's trying to. All right, you wanna leave it on about where the castellation stops. So that way you got three or four threads there. Break out your BFH, give it a few whacks right here on this flat spot. And there she goes. All right, let's so leave that loose. Many tic tacs later. Now we're gonna do the same thing on the tie rod. Pull your cotter pin back. You wanna to try to save this one or have a new one. All right, and this one's also a 19. Same trick, crack it loose. Run the nut up most of the way, and then give it a few calculated wax right about here. And if you put a little bit of pressure on it, it'll pop right out after a couple of hits. If it's being stubborn and you feel like you need to hit it on the top, make sure the top of the nut is flush with the stud because you don't want to mess up the castellated nut or the threads on the end of the stud. There it goes. And it's less about how hard you hit it and more just the fact that you're hitting it and shocking it. So then you can pull your tie rod out of the way. Okay, at this point, you've got two important bits of hardware. This is your ABS wire. You'll note the routing. It goes on the outside of the control arm. So your control arm goes inside. So we're gonna loosen this. And then this 10 millimeter bolt right here, which is probably easier with a ratchet. So what that does is takes all the strain off of the ABS speed sensor wire. Once you got those off, you wanna take off this 12 millimeter head bolt so that you've got a little bit of flex in the brain. Okay, so now we've got that taken care of. <clears throat> we can pull our spindle out of the way, our knuckle. So pull down on the upper and it's got some tension in the bushings. You know, I'm talking about tension in the bushings. You can see that. This spindle can hang free now. You don't want to pull on it because you will pull the shaft out of the inner joint. So just kind of let it chill right there. Next thing is the 19 millimeter bolt and nut at the bottom of the strut. Get it loose. You don't have to take it out, or you're not gonna be able to take it out at this time, because the next thing we do is up top. So you got three studs holding the upper strut hat, which is this part protruding through that holds the strut together and holds the spring in tension. You got three nuts, one, two, and a third one on the back, back here. Um, this is where your flex head ratchets really come into play, especially if you put them on the right way. So I always loosen the rear one first because it's the hardest one to get to. There we go. And those are a 14 millimeter. So if you loosen it first before you touch these other ones and go ahead and take it out, then you don't have to fight it. Keep these, you're gonna need them. And then the front ones, And once again, for speed, the easiest thing to do is go ahead and run that up most of the way. And then you got your last one. Right now, the only weight holding the strut down is the, the coil and the control arm and such. All right, since we are replacing the upper control arm, even if we weren't, we still would want to loosen it. So we're gonna loosen the nut right here. Pay attention to the orientation of the washer right there. All right, so once the bushings are loose, this thing's less than finger tight. Go ahead and run this out. There's the nut and the washer. 
See how the washer seats against the bushing on this side and the washer on this side. So you want it to bell out, which may be counterintuitive, but that's how it works. You can see the bushing has already deflected even in a stock application with 2000 miles and rubbed it. That's why it's offset like that. Set those aside. All right, so just take the arm loosely in one hand, push the bolt. You can work the washer down. If you use the washer as a pincher, you can work the bolt out. You may hit a point where there's some interference, but sometimes you don't. Forerunners are worse. Tacomas, you actually have to like put vice grips on this and pull it away or channel locks in order to get it. There's a tight spot right there. You just use the washer and push it through and it'll come right out. Don't worry about taking the bolt all the way out of the car because you're gonna reuse it. So you can just leave it hanging right there. At this point, this arm is free. And if yours is good, you can post it on Facebook. And if yours is bad, you can throw it in the scrap bin. All right, at this point, our strut assembly is pretty free. So as you can see, we can wiggle it. So we'll go ahead and take the nuts off of the top. Set those aside for usage here in just a few minutes. Go ahead and pull the hardware from the bottom. That also is reused. So here we're gonna push down on the control arm. Pull the bolt out of the bottom. You'll notice the strut drops down. It can now wiggle. All right, so what we wanna do is lift up, pull out at the bottom sometimes you got to push down on that arm just a little bit and then it goes down right behind the sway bar and clears at the top and the strut comes right out now the strut will come out with the control arm in place but you do have to loosen it up either way so if you're replacing control arms order of operations matters and it'll go a lot smoother and a lot faster if you do the strut work in between the arms Okay guys, this is a Brannock 7600 and you are not gonna have one of these at home. I did this crap for 20 years before I got one of these and was a professional for several years at home before I got one of these. But it is the best tool for doing struts, period. Hands down, this is what all the dealerships use, this is what all the big shops use, all your Firestones, all your NTPs, all that place. This is what the pros use. You're not going to have one of these because these are like $800. But that's okay because I have the next best alternative that works really well. This is the heavy duty cool spring compressor. This kit, mine is from SPC, um, but they are the same as the ones on Amazon. We'll put a link in the description to our affiliate link and uh, you guys can buy these. I think they're about 60, 75 bucks, something like that. I've seen them as high as a hundred and a half. For the same thing <clears throat> so we'll put a link in description for that uh, check those out these are the safest homeowner use cool spring compressors these are the ones you want the ones that you rent from the auto parts store are downright dangerous i've had those bow i've got i have a set i have like five different kinds of strut compressor because i've been through all of them take it from me this is the way to go for the home mechanic and the semi-professional um once you get to be big boy status and you got big boy shop like I got. Big boy. Just now. <laughs> uh, you're gonna want you're gonna want one of these. <clears throat> but the principle is the same. So we're gonna compress the shock. Oh, we got ours mounted on an engine stand, so it rolls around the shop. You're gonna compress it a little bit. You notice we got some slack there. This is a flat. And you want to pay attention to which direction out was when you pulled it out of the strut. So I like to leave the cap kind of like this. And it has a little mark on it for where the little slot was. That way I know which way is out because it does matter how the orientation goes back together. So the nut on top is 17 millimeter. And just like we talked about before, what you don't want to do is put an impact on this and zip it if you plan on reusing the strut. If you're going to throw this thing in the garbage, <laughs> zing baby zing 
but uh, I use a big crescent wrench. They make a socket for this, but this works fine. These aren't under any load per se because they're not old and crusty. Most of these GXs, this nut doesn't get real bad. If it's got corrosion on it, you're gonna wanna take a wire brush and some PB blaster and clean that off. But basically, you just do your ratchet wrench thing. And we're getting to the point where it's starting to squeeze off. So we'll pull that out of the way and hold the strut and take the nut off of here. The strut comes straight out the bottom. Bushings back on, and this is ready for the next guy. Take the load off the strut compressor. And inside there is a washer, and we're not gonna reuse that. Really all we need is this part with the studs. And so we're gonna pop that out with a screwdriver, put that with our uh, takeoff shock, and once again, either goes in the scrap bin or to the next guy. Okay, so now we're gonna prep our coilover for assembly. Uh, we take anti-seize and apply a liberal amount to the threads because we do not want our coilover to gall up according to the instructions for our application, which is Toyota Land Cruiser Prado 150 series and FJ Cruiser, 8.38 inches. And that is from the bottom of the coil to the center of the hole. So we're gonna take our tape measure, we're gonna measure here, we're like 10 and a half, or almost 10. So we're gonna run this down. Yeah, close on. A little panel. You'll notice I added some assembly lube between the seat and the spring. You can use anti-seize too. Something with a little more grease property works pretty well, but you don't want to use too much of it because it will attract dirt. But once the weight's on it, it won't really move anything. So we're gonna measure here. We're at about eight and a half. So we're pretty close. So we're gonna come down another turn or two. Yep, that's right where we wanna be. Okay, uh, and tip of the coil is gonna go right here. What I find at this point, because it is kinda hard to measure from here down when you're in the car, is go ahead and actually put that up to the bottom right there and get that dimension, which I find eight inches works pretty great for like the two and a half inch lift point. Uh, our coils are C59 314s which is the two and a half kit. We do have two inches of rake, so we'll get about two and three quarter-ish on the front, and we'll wind up with about an inch in the rear, so that leaves a little over an inch of rake, roughly. It's about where we want to be. I find the rears usually settle a little bit. So we're gonna run this bottom seat up. right in there make sure it turns smoothly you don't want any tight spots and we're not going to lock these but we're just by hand just kind of seat them together so they don't really move okay you'll notice you got a plethora of washers here so there's one with a larger hole and one with a smaller hole so the one with the bigger hole is going to go on the bottom and since this truck is new this bushing is still good so we're going to run it let's stand this up Put the boot over the top. We're gonna take the thicker washer, and put it on the bottom, and then we're gonna head back over to the spring compressor. And this is gonna go together with this on top. Once again, we noted we have our out mark. So let's head on over here to the spring compressor. Just like when we took it apart, we're gonna take our coil. You want it to sit snugly and roughly centered. You'll notice this coil is quite a bit longer. So we'll run this up, take the hat. The pigtail has a mark where it ended. I usually like to go ahead and try to put that back where it was and then rotate the coil so that your out is facing out. So we'll put a little bit of pressure on it, kind of hold her in place. Take your strut, insert from the bottom through the hole in the top, making sure your spring seat is seated properly. 
And then you run this guy down. Now that we're through, place our bushing and the washer. And the nut to hold everything in place. Now you may be tempted at this point to just grab an impact and zip that down. No, no, no. No, 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 no. We don't want to do that. So we're going to squish that a little bit. Verify the bottom of the spring is seated where it needs to be because it will move on you. Okay, so how you want to do this is you want your 18 ratchet wrench and then you want to hold the shock shaft still. What I find works best is to use a hex driver and then a breaker bar, 3 8 drive breaker bar, so that the shock shaft doesn't spin while you're tightening the nut. That's On this nut, you're gonna wanna make sure you snug it all the way down. You don't have to over tighten it, but you wanna run it down where it stops. Okay. Okay, at this point, this is our out, and you can tell that our shock is out of line. You've got two options here. One, you can do like we're gonna do, which is compress the coil a little bit and turn it. But you'll actually be able to adjust this once it's in the car, and these pins are stuck in the strut tower. But we're gonna do it now, because we're here. So we'll put a little bit of compression on the coil, and then we'll just go ahead and Turn that dude by hand. Try to get that line straight. And you can eyeball it. There's a little bit of deflection in there. And you can adjust it with a crescent wrench on the bottom. You can grab it at the bottom of the shock if you need to later on. But that's going to get us going. All right. Time to put it in the truck. So this is where our clocking comes into play. So installation is the reverse of disassembly. Up in here, and then just a slight press on the bottom puts that in there. This is the part where I like to go ahead and put the bottom bolt in because on the passenger side it kind of is pushed up into the studs at the top. And the reason I put the bottom in first is because if you tighten the top, it's going to pull the shock outward because of the deflection. Yahtzee. Yahtzee! So put the lower bolt in loose and then the nuts on the upper strut mount. Like we talked about when we took them apart, do the rear one last so then you can run it down by hand so you don't have to fight it for so long. Alrighty, now we gotta go get our control arm out of the box. Dobinson supplies you with new washers. I really don't know what the difference is, but I typically use them just so, because, you know, I don't know, whatever. They come with it. Uh, the bolt is still chilling where it was. Use the washer. Make sure you face the washer with the bell out. Also, make sure you grab the right in this hand, the right, the correct control arm. Mind you, it goes under the ABS wire. Same method going back in. And feed it using the washer so you don't have to tear a bunch of stuff up. So you just take bites with the washer. Slip it up into place. You do have to finagle with it a little bit. I will say it's a little easier when you don't have a camera in the way. But feed the bolt through the arm. Start the arm on the cross shaft. And then use the washer and your fingertips. 
to get the bolt started. They usually start pretty easy. It's that next eight inches that takes all the effort. And you just kind of want to wiggle the arm so it's not bound up. Feed it in there. You'll feel it hit the other side. When you get to this point, you can grab it with a 19 and just push it through. And when you can see it's protruding here. Same thing, washer facing out, and you're done. However, do not torque this thing down yet. Because we want to do that at right height. At this juncture, we can reinstall our upright. I usually find it easier to do it first. Start the nut. And I'll show you a little something about castellated nuts. Okay, so castellated nut, you can see the hole is at a certain depth. Some ball joints take a washer right here and some don't. And the thing you gotta make sure is that the cotter pin is gonna be fully seated inside that castellation. You don't want it to loosen itself, but in the case of like a wheel bearing, you don't want it to over tighten itself either. Ask me how I know. Down here, we're gonna put the tie rod back on. There we go. Okay, you can snug those up to torque spec. All right. Okay guys, sorry about the audio on that last little bit. I did not plug in the uh, lav mic, so sorry. I had to change the battery on the GoPro. All right, so this side is pretty much done. We're gonna put our hardware back in for our ABS and brake lines. Once again, make sure that you run the ABS on the outside. It goes right here on the little stud. And then there's a nut. It comes in with your control, comes with your control arm kit. Um, make sure you put this bracket back on because we don't want any of this stuff moving around. You'll notice it kind of pulls tight right here. We'll put that together, start it, okay. And then because we have a little more travel, what I normally do is just take this bracket and just give it a tweak so that it's not under tension. You can open it up like that and that just takes a little bit of pressure off of it. That's all you really gotta have. You want it retained, but you don't want it being pulled. Okay, snug all those pieces back up, and this side is done. So, just like doing the rear, I'm gonna go ahead and knock out the other side, because it takes me way longer to talk about it than it does just to knock it out and do it. Don't forget your cotter pin here and here on your tie rod, and then once I get the other side put together, I'll show you how to torque everything down and we'll set ride heights. Well, one thing I forgot to mention to you guys, uh, the passenger side is pushed up, driver's side is pushed down by the sway bar when you have KDSS. So on the driver's side, you may need to put a jack under it, keep it from falling down. Driver's side is now all put together. And so the trick here is just gonna be to pull the skid plate out of the way, or if you've already removed it, so using the jack to slowly pressurize the sway bar. Don't have to, but I am using the new Harbor Freight Badlands jack. Check out our review and initial impressions on that one. I'm just gonna start these by hand because you do not want to cross thread these. So mount the bracket. Cruise over here to the passenger set. Okay, and same procedure in the rear. And of course, the cherry on top of all this work. 
Ka chow. All right, that's it. There she is. Pimpin' ain't easy, kids. let it sit overnight we got to tighten some control arms before we can send it over for alignment so that's what we're gonna do and the trick for that is in the rear you put it on jack stands but we got a couple other tricks here um, you can slide under the thing and fight it if you want to I don't like that we are currently down on the ground but I have not rolled it yet and we are at 39 and a half at the fender which is way too much but watch this. We're just gonna roll it backwards and forwards and get the suspension out of a bind because right now the tires are pushing it up because it was on jacks. What was 39 and a half is now 38 and a quarter. That's a valid bit of information. And in the rear, We're at 39. 38 and an eighth. So what that gives us is about three quarters of an inch of rake, maybe seven eighths, but that's right where we want it. Let's double check our side to side. A little high on this side. 39 and a half. What were we over here? 39 and a quarter, so we're pretty close. Quarter inch side to side on a KDSS car. It's pretty close, it's pretty close, pretty close. But I think what we're gonna wanna do, this side's at 39 and three quarter. And this side's at, wait, 38 and, Jesus, can't brain today. 38 and a quarter. Driver's side is at 38 and three quarter. So we need to come down a half inch on the driver's side. Not a problem, easy to do. That is not uncommon. Um, we don't want to go up on the passenger side because I've already got my height leveled out from the rear where I want it. Now, what you gotta remember is you are corner weighting. So as we reduce the preload on the spring in the left front, the right rear will come up. Currently have a quarter inch side to side in the back and in the front, we're gonna bring it down a quarter of an inch, which should probably bring that rear up about an eighth. So that'll get us within an eighth left to right, which is very nice. All right, so I'm gonna yank this wheel off Real quick, we're just gonna throw the jack under it. We're gonna yank the wheel off. Now, the lever ratio on the coilover to the arm is about two to one. So if we wanna come down a half an inch on the ride height, that means we need to try to come down about a quarter inch on our spring preload, roughly. So we're gonna shoot for that and we're gonna be pretty close. Freaking KDSS, man, every time, every time. They're never dead on. Also, if you're running a nitro shock where you don't have a threaded body and you need a quarter of an inch, what you want to do is go up on the opposite corner. So if we needed, say we needed that quarter inch on, or that half inch on the driver's front to come down, it actually means you would need to preload the right rear. So you would actually need to raise the right rear to offset for that. Otherwise, you've got to have a fixed height in the front and you can only keep going up. There's not really an adjustment there. Something to keep in mind. It's one of the reasons I prefer the threaded body coilover setup with the IMS. They also ride a lot smoother than the nitro shocks in my experience. I don't have long-term experience with the nitro shocks, but I do know that these are killer. So this is the reason we put the lubricant on the threads, the anti-seize and the grease on the bottom of the shock color. You never wanna try to adjust coilovers with the weight on the vehicle. 
these don't have very much preload at all in them by comparison and the suspension's at full droop with everything loose uh, as far as the the bushings and such goes so it's okay to make an adjustment at this point especially if you're going down so reducing preload so if you'll remember we set this from the bottom of the coil to the center of the bolt hole at eight and three eighths however you can't see the bottom of the coil the way the coil's clocked which is what i talked about previously so what i like to do is get myself a reference point right here where these meet depending upon how it's clocked you can tuck the tape measure in here and we are currently at seven and let's see we'll go right here we're at eight inches so we want to come down a quarter of an inch now Dobinson's includes spanner wrenches, but I will tell you that they're a little short and they're a little thick and they're kind of hard to use. So we'll put a link in the description to these. These are the ones I've been using for a couple years now. They seem to work pretty good. So we loosen the lower collar and you want to come down to about where you think you want it. So that's about a quarter of an inch. And then our top collar is the one that actually has the weight on it. So we'll start loosening it. Now when your coilovers have miles on them, you're not going to be able to do this as easily. So a lot of times you're going to have to take them off and use a strut compressor. And they're a little stiff till they get moving. But it's okay. It's not going to jack anything up as long as you lubricated it properly. Lube is essential. That's what she said. Once we get a little bit of pressure off of them, they'll go a little easier. Now you might ask yourself why I didn't just go ahead and set these a quarter inch lower from the get-go. And I thought about it, but the thing is, this KDSS kind of acts a little different on most of these vehicles. It's not cut and dry. It's not something that you can just, you know, apply the same rule to every visit every car um, it tends to be a little hit or miss plus customers have varying loads in their vehicles some people just have you know a duffel bag in the back and other people have a fridge and drawer systems and all that crap so i like to see where the rear lands before i set the front because the front is where the only real adjustment is unless you're putting spring packers in the back okay we made our adjustment and we're set a quarter inch lower than we were let's check it and you do have to roll it back and forth okie dokie so now we are within about 3 16 all the way around, left to right, roughly. KDSS, it's gonna catch you every time. At this point, we are going to tighten up our upper control arms. We're gonna snug our lower control arms. We're gonna go around the back. We're gonna tighten everything down where it's supposed to be on our control arms. And then it's headed for alignment, which luckily for me is across the hall. Ha ha ha, that's it. If you are doing this at home and you need to drive it to an alignment shop, what I normally do is set the camber at maximum on the lower control arms. So maximum negative camber, and then loosen the tie rod adjuster and just look down the edge of the tire until it's basically flat with the back tire. Just catch a sight line, kind of like you want to catch a sight line kind of like that. As you can see, it's towed in a little bit. But if you can square it up, if you can get it pretty close to square, you're going to be in good shape at least to drive a few miles to go get the thing aligned. Always get it aligned. Lock down your lower control arms, lock down your upper control arms, and lock down the rear control arms. Otherwise, you're going to have cracking and popping. All right, guys, our GX is all finished up from being aligned, and here she is.
right, y'all. Thank you so much for joining us for our in-depth Dobbinson's IMS suspension. We are always happy to have you all along. We did these videos a little different than how we normally do. If you like this kind of format, jump in the comments. Tell us what you think. If you didn't like this kind of format, jump in the comments. Tell us what you think. If you've got anything in particular that you need to see a how-to on, jump in the comments. Tell us what you think. We sure appreciate it. Be sure you like, subscribe, share, and we'll uh, see you on the next one.